Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're so excited to be launching the CRAW Virtual Town Hall Series with the financial support of the National Science Foundation and publicity collaboration with ACMW. We are kicking off this series with our first webinar on inviting, inventing technology for homes and families with A.J. Bernheim Rush, who's a senior researcher at Microsoft. I, Lori Pollack, will be your host today. Since this is our first seminar, please, we ask for your patience and understanding, and most importantly, your feedback. Before we start, I need to review some logistics with you. As many of you are joining us for the first time, you actually have the option to join with your computer, your cell phone, or your tablet if you want to actually get involved with the polls uh, using the WebEx app. So this is completely up to you. You can join as a group or you can join individually. If you have any technical problems, just submit your questions to us through the Q&A box. In fact, at any time, you will have the opportunity to submit your questions related to the speaker's topic as well as mentoring-related topics. Your questions will be answered by either our speaker during our live Q&A session or throughout the session as, our, as a private response. As you can see on your screen, this is the Q&A box where you will submit your questions and the speaker will be able to view them. So throughout the presentation, we will have some polls for you to answer. That always makes it fun. So first of all, don't click on the PowerPoint to answer the poll. Instead, use the polling section on the right-hand side of your screen to select your answers. I, the moderator, will let you know when the polls are open. And then you'll be able to see the overall results of the polls as each poll closes. So let's start our first poll. The polls are now open. We want to know if you're interested in pr pursuing undergrad research. Possible answers, yes, no, or I'm just really not sure. So select one answer and make sure you don't click on the, on the PowerPoint slide. If you have any trouble with the poll, just submit a question in, and one of our staff members will assist you. So while you're working on the poll, let me, um, let me tell you a little bit about some of our programs. We have some, a couple programs for undergrad researchers. We have the DREW program and the CREW program. The DREW program is an, a, an, a, a way to be able to do research in the summertime, while the CREW is during the academic year. If you want more information on these, just go to the CRAW.org website. So our poll results are in. So you can look for the poll results down in the right-hand box. Um, so it looks like we've had some people who are, have, are actually participating in undergrad research. So we will have more polls throughout the whole session today. So as the host of this town hall, let me introduce myself. I'm calling in from the University of Delaware, where I'm a professor in computer and information sciences. I, my current research focuses on program analysis for building better software maintenance tools to help software engineers become more efficient. I'm also a CRAW board member uh, and one of the ones co-organizing these town hall events. So um, I'd now like to introduce AJ Brush. She's also a CRAW board member. In fact, she's one of the current co-chairs and she's a senior researcher at Microsoft Research. Dr. Brush's research area is human-computer interaction with a focus on ubiquitous computing and computer-supported collaboration. Today, we will hear about her most well-known research on technologies for families and home automation, and she's the co-leader of the Lab of Things project. So let's turn it over to AJ. Thanks, Lori. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to all of you about my research and my career path. Uh, so Lori already mentioned uh, that I'm a senior researcher at Microsoft Research, 
And today I'll be telling you a little bit about, about my research, my job, how I got here, and then of course we'll do some mentoring questions. I really encourage you to submit your questions. That always makes it more fun for everyone. So I have a PhD in computer science from the University of Washington, and my field of research is human-computer interaction. I basically study and build technology for homes and families, and I cross kind of two disciplines. One is ubiquitous computing, which thinks about computing embedded into the world around you, and the other is computer, computer excuse me, supported collaboration. And the group I usually work with is families, and the place I usually look at computing is in the home. So we're already to your second poll, uh, and this is really so I can understand the audience. The question is, have you taken a class on human-computer interaction? And I realize some of you may be a group of you or whatever. Just go with the majority. There's, there's no right or wrong answer here. I'm just curious. Um, and while you take the poll, I'll actually tell you that I never took a class in human-computer interaction, actually an official class in undergrad or grad. It was something I discovered midway through grad, grad school and then did a lot of seminars uh, and learning and sort of on uh, as an intern. So don't worry. If you fall in love with, with a subject, there are many ways to uh, learn about it. So great. So it looks like most of you haven't. Uh, so this uh, hopefully will be a little taste. And if it's an option at your uh, college or university, you can try it there, or else there are many ways to learn about it. So what I wanted to tell you is kind of one of the main ideas in human-computer interaction is user-centered design. And so this means taking into account um, user needs through every stage. So this, these three boxes are basically how I do all my projects. And you'll see examples of this with real projects in a second. So the first part is understanding what people are doing now or maybe pain points around something they're doing. The second is really fun. We build a, a prototype that might be out of paper. It might be uh, with code. And then the most important part for me is figuring out, did we build something that actually addresses those needs? So let me show you some examples. First, I want to talk to you about homes and families. So I find homes and families fascinating because there's lots of people and there's lots of different kinds of devices. So it's this crazy situation where things are coming in and out and there's lots of people working uh, together. Um, but it might actually be because I have a built-in prototyping lab. So I always try to show some pictures of my family. So uh, you'll see through all my projects, there are pictures of my kids. Uh, this is actually my son and the my son in the bottom there doing video play dating, which was a project we did about how uh, video conferencing could be more immersive for children. Um, you'll see a calendar that you'll see later in my kitchen, uh, a computer you can talk to in the kitchen about five years ago, and then some of the sensors that are in my house today. So third question, third poll is, have you ever shared a computer with someone you lived with? And of course, you can see that I'm trying to be funny and I'm not actually funny here, but uh, you get the idea. So the reason I'm interested in this is uh, often we look at computing in the home and we see that we've really taken some of the metaphors of the office, like everything is private, everyone has to log in, and we've dropped that into the home. So for many years, I've looked at how we could make um, login in the home more uh, naturally match kind of that shared environment where you keep people out with locks and doors, but once they're inside, uh, there's more sharing. Great, yes, as I expected, there's a lot of sharing going on. Um, so I'm gonna show you in the course of this talk one of my very first projects uh, as, an, as a researcher when I started at Microsoft and my most recent project, so you'll kind of get the historical context. So when I started here, I sort of was on fire. I didn't even have any kids, but I had a, a paper calendar upstairs in my house and a paper calendar downstairs, and I'm like, these are always out of sync. I'm a computer scientist, like why is this so hard? Why am I writing everything twice? But there's lots of simple questions when you're trying to coordinate with your friends or your family that come up that actually involve a lot of effort to figure out. So the first thing we did, and this is a picture of one of my intern, Carmen, who worked on, on this project for a long time, is we wanted to understand current behavior. So what I'm showing you here, I did a big study uh, with lots of moms, and they brought in their calendars, and we talked through them, and we learned about what was working well for them and what was not. The next step, and, and this was a, a multi-year project, but the first thing we did, which is particularly useful actually when you're trying to just test out ideas, is we build paper versions first. You'll see that at the top one. We built a whole paper version of this interface. We actually brought people in and they did tasks with it and we learned a ton from that. And then we actually built a digital version. 
And even on the paper uh, interface, we learned that, you know, people have their own routine. Some people use color because they want to really call out important things, and other people have a different color for every kit, right? So what we really want to do is give people the tools that they need and let them use those to fit how they organize their lives. Um, you can tell this is a long time ago by that smartphone, which was like current at that point, um, but we really saw there was mobility, right? People were not always standing around their kitchen looking at their paper calendar. So a big need was access to calendars outside of the home, which probably sounds silly now that you carry your phone around all the time, but back then was, was quite an issue. And then there had been some thoughts that people want to coordinate, you know, like mom might send dad a calendar appointment, which sounds ridiculous and it did to me, but this data backed that up. But there was lots of coordination, but it was not normally done through the appointment mechanism that we use at work or maybe you use to like schedule a study group. It was done through conversation and then the calendar was really the memory device to make sure everyone got to the right place. So poll four, I thought I would just take advantage of having you all here um, and see how things might have changed. I'm curious if you all have now used digital calendars, if you don't use any calendars, if you still find that trusty paper to be useful, which we see a lot, um, or anything else that you use to schedule. I can't resist doing some research. I apologize and thank you for participating in my study. Oh, and that first question is supposed to be paper, not pager, <laughs> and planner, not Palmer. Um, but, you know, we're trying to be funny and keep this interactive, so hopefully you're all sitting wherever you are laughing, laughing out loud at our uh, typos. So one of the things I really enjoy about being at Microsoft Research is we're typically working out ahead of our product groups, but then we get to revisit our projects as the technology kind of catches up with where we are. Um, so the calendar has been a project where I did a lot of work 10 years ago, but I still interact frequently uh, with the product groups around this as we think of things we can do to improve our calendaring uh, software. So we'll come back to the answer of the poll in a second, but I am going to keep going. Um, right. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about that second piece that we did, which was building the digital prototype. Um, so we did the paper version, which I talked to you about, and then we built a real inkable digital calendar. And we did this using a slate, uh, a tablet computer, which at that time was very expensive and unusual. And then we put that into people's houses uh, for for a user study. So we deployed it um, into real homes. So these are some of the places that our participants put, put their calendar. So I gave them, this is actually a picture frame stand, but that was perfect for holding the slate tablet. Um, and this is a person putting it on the bookshelf. And I took four families. So these are their calendars at the beginning of the study. So I had three people using, you know, kind of that quintessential paper calendar in the kitchen and one person who was using AOL at the time. And then these are their calendars four weeks later. So um, Link was an inkable calendar where you could write on that little sticky note in the top and then drag things on, and you had all the different color choices that you wanted to make. We had kids drawing pizza, which you can see in the bottom left, and lots of stars and, and all sorts of fun things going on uh, during the study that we learned a lot about. What I wanted to highlight, actually, is the reason one of the reasons I love doing research at Microsoft is if you figure out some things, then I can go to and work with the product groups to actually move them into the products that people um, use. So we have calendar charms, which are these small pictures um, in Outlook.com, and those came directly from the pictures that we saw our participants uh, drawing on the calendar, that idea is from there. And then you may not know Windows Family Room uh, because it was only for the Windows phone, but it was a very cool shared space. It's a very cool shared space that gives families automatically, when they set it up, a shared calendar, shared chat, and share photos. And a lot of the work uh, we learned about changes. So we want to track, you know, if you change the calendar and I don't know it, that's really important that people are aware of changes. So a bunch of learnings went into features for uh, Family Room, which was super fun for me. Ah, I see that we have a very like digital calendar focused audience, which is really interesting. I love to see that shift. I think it's really exciting. Okay, so that was my first big project when I came to Microsoft Research. It was really about um, coordination and awareness and family scheduling. 
And that's what I worked on for about six years with a number of different projects. Uh, Sparks was actually a pre-Facebook project where we were worried that people would not want to share things, so we suggested photos for them to share. Little did we know that Facebook would teach us that it's like dealing with all the stuff that everyone shares that's the problem, not encouraging people to share. And then you heard me talk about uh, my son doing video play dates. So we did a bunch of experiments around immersive video um, for kids playing over distance or kids interacting with parents. I then uh, really enjoyed that application layer, but as I was in everyone's houses, I was noticing something I already kind of told you about, that people are sharing technology and the way that we use login and the way computers are set up do not naturally match how families or households or even maybe roommates that share technology, although that's probably rarer, um, use, use shared PCs. So we did a study called Yours, Mine, and Ours where we went to a bunch of homes and we looked at what people had themselves, what they shared with others. We then built a new, totally different family accounts login system, I'm still working on, on that for Microsoft, but um, that tried to uh, let there be a kind of shared login and then you could transition into your own and it was very smooth. After that, I got very excited about speech in the kitchen, uh, and so we put all-in-one computers with array microphones, this is before Connect, before all that stuff, into people's kitchens to see what they might say if they could talk to a computer in their kitchen. Learned a ton from that study. And then lastly, I looked at phone sharing and uh, the fact that actually, even though we think of the phone as a personal object, it gets passed around to show people things, and that it's a little weird that there's binary, you know, put in your pin and then someone can have everything, or nothing, um, and that we might think about how we uh, permission the phone slightly differently. So all of that happened, and then I'm going to get to the last section of the talk, and then you'll hear about my job and, and how I got here. So from in about 2009, um, I was still working in the home, and I was thinking about energy management and sustainability and how we can um, basically use sensing uh, to improve uh, usage of resources in the home. So home heating is one great example where there's a lot of waste. Um, and from that, uh, myself and some other researchers uh, noticed that uh, home automation was a huge issue. Clicking. Um, and we actually started working in the Internet of Things when we started looking at all the connected devices in the home. And you know the Internet of Things is big because there's a million different names for it. And that brings me to my fifth poll, which is, have you heard of the Internet of Things? I'm going to keep going and, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, and keep talking while you all work on the poll. Um, so if you haven't heard of the Internet of Things, uh, and I like this definition because it highlights both the sensors and the actuators. So it's putting everything on online, uh, available from the Internet, from jet engines to rice cookers. Um, and this is quite crazy, and I, I'm really interested because there's all sorts of devices coming online for the home environment. In fact, the reason why you hear about this so much in the news and everywhere else is, it, and, and it seems like, uh, yeah, 50-50. If you haven't heard about it, if you start looking, I bet you will. But it's because, and I love this graphic because it really shows how many things there are. In 2008, the number of things connected exceeded the number of people. And, you know, this is a prediction among many, but people are expecting billions and billions uh, in the not-too-distant future. So, again, we followed the same steps. So I went out to a bunch of houses. I interviewed people. I surveyed to find out um, what people who already had home automation and connected devices in the home were doing. And they wanted it for convenience because it allowed them to be lazy, for peace of mind, so security, what's happening in my home, and also just remote control. Turn that off, turn that on. There's tons of pain points. So at the end of every interview, I would, because these are people who adopted, I would say, wow, you seem really happy. Do you recommend this to your friends and family? And they would say, do you want me to still have friends and family? Of course I don't do that. And I would say that is fascinating, and we would talk more about that. Issues with setup, issues with adding new things, issues with how much time and money it takes, and issues with how you manage it. And so what we did was step back and say, why are we having these problems? It's basically because there are, uh, the device makers were saying, hey, we'll just get everything to talk to each other, and then we're done. That's actually not enough. Or you have to just use devices only made by one company, and then you can't extend, and you're stuck uh, with what they offer you. So the first case, you have troubles with setup and management. 
In the second case, you can't really extend. So of course, we built something, uh, which is a research system called HomeOS and then Lab of Things. Uh, it is available, I think this next slide is going to show you, on the web as an SDK that people who want to start using connected devices can download and start use. There's actually curriculum for taking classes and doing things, and you're welcome to check it out. But what I really wanted to show you was some of the fun things that people have built with it. Um, it's used by tons of student developers. So this first picture is uh, some students at the University of Washington in an undergrad capstone class use the um, Connect sensor, and they made it so when you pointed at a light, then it would go on. So they did all sorts of cool math around determining where you were gesturing and then turning on that light. Sorry, there's a delay when I click. So this uh, picture is students at MIT who built a rules on demand. So if you open the door and you want the light to go on, you open the door, turn on the light, and then their interface would say, would you like that light to always go on when you open this door? So they're basically programming their home by demonstration. This is a great group of students at the University of Waterloo. They built a model of how much energy your house uses, and then if it changes, they would send you alerts like, hey, you're using three times as much energy today as you did last Tuesday. Possibly something is wrong. Um, and then this is a great project from Pakistan where they're having um, power outages, and so they actually built their own power strip and then used lab of things so the end user could say, hey, if there's a, it's actually uh, called load shedding. So the power goes down significantly, but not all the way. So then on your uh, power strip, you get to say, when there's a load shedding event, keep the fan on and this on, but the other things can turn off. So it helps people have more control over what happens when the, there's such a dramatic reduce in power available to the home. And then lastly, this is a group at the University of Maryland, and their expertise is in low-cost sensing. So they're building very low-cost sensors for people who are paraplegic, um, and so they can wear these sensors and then do gestures, and then that turns on things in the house. So all of a sudden, someone who might be in a wheelchair or have um, other restricted movement can make a gesture and control um, the lights or things around them. So that's a very inspirational project. So now I'm going to tell you about my job. Uh, relatively quickly, so start thinking of your questions about mentoring and grad school. Um, so in my job, I work in Microsoft Research, as I mentioned. We have a huge number of researchers, but it's still relatively small uh, relative to the whole size of Microsoft. So we're a super big computer science department, but very, very small relative to the company. Super awesome people that I work with, one of my very favorite uh, parts of my job. Many of these people were involved uh, in the projects I just talked about actually get evaluated on three things. Uh, am I having impact in the research community? I do this through public publications and academic influence. And am I having product influence, right? So I showed you some specific examples, but that is how part of how we're evaluated. And then finally, am I generating uh, intellectual property? Am I building new things for the company? And then I get to do service, um, which I focus on my research community and diversity like CRAW. Um, I spend my time uh, on projects, going to meetings, uh, consulting to product groups, doing service and traveling. I wanted to show you this picture just to highlight uh, how different my job is at different times. So last summer I was spending all of my time on research. I'm probably more like a professor at one of your schools or things like that. Right now I'm working really, really closely with a product group and um, I am spending all my time there. The last thing I'm going to show you is a quick uh, pictorial of how I ended up at MSR. So I grew up in California, where it's very, very sunny. I then went to Williams College. Yay! It's a small liberal arts school on the East Coast, about 2,000 students, uh, only about 15 uh, computer science majors in my class. It is uh, not sunny there. Actually, it snows. And then I actually did summer research at the University of Oregon as an undergrad between my sophomore and junior years. I did that in our Drew program, uh, so I encourage you all to check that out. It really uh, helped me understand that research was something for me that I wanted to do. After, oh, and it was sunny <laughs> in Oregon, very sunny, it was lovely. And I actually worked in parallel computing, which is not what I do now, but um, was a, is a really interesting research area. I went back to Williams. I did my undergrad thesis. It was still snowing in Williams during the winter on parallel computing, um, actually debuggers for parallel computing. So I was always interested in working with people. I then went to grad school at the University of Washington, where it rains here. It does rain, not all the time, but it does. 
Um, I started working in parallel computing and graphics. So I entered thinking I would work in parallel computing and graphics. Uh, and then I got married, <laughs> um, and I look really young in that photo, which is funny. I moved to St. Louis, where my husband was in medical school, and I took a year off between my master's and my PhD, and I worked in industry. And that's actually where I found HCI. I was asked to do a print dialogue, uh, and I thought someone must have really good best practices about building print dialogues for software, and I discovered all the research in human-computer interaction. It was the weather in St. Louis was crazy. Um, and... Then I returned back to grad school on fire to be in human-computer interaction, um, did internships, still raining, did an internship at Microsoft Research, and then finished grad school and joined MSR in 2004. So you now know more about me than most of my Facebook friends, but I wanted to show you that um, I've changed research areas, I didn't always know what I wanted to do, and so it's totally fine if you don't know yet, um, I just encourage you to Check out research, see if you like it or not, you know, do internships, do research at school, do school projects, just explore and see what's best for you. Okay, so I've got the user-centered design uh, process here, tons of ways you can reach me and try uh, some other things. I would like to encourage you all uh, to submit questions, and I think I'm going to turn it back over to Lori now for our Mentoring. Um, oh, yes. Here's the Q&A box. I'd like to ask you each to submit at least one question, and I'll turn it back over to Lori. Great. Thank you, AJ. This is so awesome. I was really, I really enjoy learning about technology for the homes and families. In fact, now I'm all inspired to uh, try out your lab of things and try to come up with a new course that uses that software infrastructure. That, that would be great. That would be so cool, yeah. Okay, so I have a couple questions here that have come in. Uh, first question, so I think we're going to, the way we're going to do this is we'll ask some research questions and then we'll move on to uh, mentoring topics. So uh, in terms of, of research, one of the questions that came in from uh, Sarah is what do, you, what do you primarily use for, re for your user studies? observation, interviews, surveys, or just going in and immersing yourself? Oh, that's a great question. So what you just heard from Lori is that there are many different ways that we can do user research, right? We can go in, we can do a survey. I'm sure you've all been surveyed a million times, right? But that is a form of user research. Surveys work best when we're asking questions that are very clear and straightforward and ask you about recent behavior or something you know well. Um, I do a mix of those. Typically what I start with is interviews in order to learn um, what's going on. The less I know about something, the more I want to go and observe and think about it. And then often what we do, but that's hard to do with very many people, so we call that like more small n, right? You can do that with 10 or 12 or 15, but it takes a long time. And then typically we build a survey out from that, and that's how we get big n, thousands of people. Um, and that gives us confidence in the findings that we might have seen with a small group of people. Um, yes, so uh, in most projects, I end up using all of those different methods, but um, I, I, yeah, I love them all. You just have to figure out what's right for the question you're asking. Asking. I have a whole nother talk on that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> so how did you learn how to do these user studies and design them? Oh, it's an excellent question. You know, looking back, if I had known that I was going to do HCI, I, I would have taken a lot more classes in it. But um, I was really lucky. I did an internship at Microsoft Research, and uh, some of the leading luminaries of HCI are actually at Microsoft Research and have been, so I kind of did on-the-job training. And then I also took a class in user usability studies at the University of Washington in our department. They actually had a class where we designed the study out and we thought really hard about it. There are some great books on it. Um, there's lots of ways to learn, but actually you kind of have to try it. Um, one of the talks I usually give at conferences is sort of like, uh, the top 10 things not to do when you're doing a user study because I've certainly learned through doing things wrong. Um, but, but basically, some class, some on the job doing, and, and some uh, like um, interning. Okay, so I have another question here from Shelly. Shelly asks, do, you, do we 
we have to be worried about the future with lots of sensors watching what we do as we go about our daily lives. I really love that question. Shelley, thank you for asking that. Um, I do get asked about privacy a lot working in IoT, um, and actually all the way through. Um, for me, one of the key things is figuring out um, as we move from physical to digital, how do we make things transparent so people even understand what's happening, right? So if you think about having a paper calendar in the kitchen or even in your office, right, you know when people are stopping by to see if I'm in my office. But if people are, like, looking at my digital calendar, I don't have any idea, right, what's going on. Um, in a similar way, if someone was driving by your house every day, you would be like, huh, why is someone driving by my house every day? But if they were somehow looking at your camera, then you wouldn't know. So what we try have, we've tried to do in Lab of Things, and we actually had a whole privacy research uh, theme in there that we looked at cameras in the home and what people were comfortable with and not comfortable with. Um, we're always trying to go for transparency and helping people understand what data is being collected and what can be inferred from that. I also looked at location privacy pretty seriously and have a couple papers on that. Um, again, I think one of the trickiest things is it's hard to know what can be inferred from your data. Um, and so as a, as a group of people working in computer science, it's kind of on us to figure out how to surface to people what can be inferred, right? So that you've probably seen the stories, right? If I know your electric use in your house, I can infer when you're home. So we have to think very carefully about how we um, fuzz that data out, all the other things we do with that data. Great question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Ayana asked the question, what happens to your research ideas after they've been shown to be successful in your user studies? Oh, also, that's great. Thank you. Uh, it depends. Um, so sometimes, uh, so often, I, I, I work with lots of different product groups at Microsoft. One of the great things about being here is we have products that do almost everything. Um, so I typically write a paper uh, about what's happened, uh, what I've done. Like I just did a study on whether you could use the battery of an electric vehicle to power the house and whether that would be cost savings and help the electric grid. Um, so we often write that out. We write those up. We submit them to um, conferences so that we can present our work. And then often, depending on how far out it is from our current Microsoft product, I'll kind of go around and talk to my collaborators in the product group and talk to them about what we learned and what implications that has for existing products. It's a little bit um, tricky because if we're working three to five years out, then you know I can't go and tell someone something, hey, in three to five years you should do something. So often what happens is when product groups go into planning, they come and talk to me, and I actually show them my research from about you know a little while ago because now is the time. And it's not usually that exactly what I did is right, but that we learn something that can be used to help make decisions in a product direction. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, one more uh, question on research. So, um, Maybelline is asking the question, is it possible to collaborate with lab, lab of Things for a hackathon hosted by a university? Oh, great question. Um, it's probably yes. You, you probably don't even need us, but we're always happy to support people. Um, so, yeah, you can just send me mail. We can, we can talk about the best way to do that. Okay. Great. So we're going to move into the uh, session that's more on mentoring. We really appreciate the research, but we're trying to make the town hall be a combination of research and mentoring. And our mentoring um, is towards graduate school in, in this session. So we're going to start out with asking AJ, um, what's her opinion on why should I consider graduate school? Sure. And, and first, uh, let me just say there are many, many different careers in computer science. I just want you to have a career in computer science, uh, the one that's right for you. Um, but reasons to, con uh, you know, and my reason to go to grad school is basically like I love to learn and I didn't feel like I knew enough when I was done with undergrad. Um, but there are so many career options. Uh, one reason you might want to go to grad school is you really want to focus on big and important problems. Um, you might want to be a university professor, right, and think about that and teaching and giving back. Um, if you want a lot of in independence, um, graduate school might be for you. I mean, essentially, you're learning how to identify a problem space, define a reasonable problem, and then answer it. 
Um, and that is a particular thing that works for some people and doesn't work for other people. Um, you might enjoy being an expert, right? When you go to grad school, you become very, very deep in a particular topic. Um, we do have, and I'm just going to, we have all these uh, nice handouts that you'll get a link to at the end, which has lots of inf more information about why graduate school. Oh, look, did I hit them all? I just put that up. <laughs> <for free. laughs> um, yeah, I think it's worth considering, right? And one of the reasons we encourage people to do undergrad research, either at your university or somewhere else, is you can get a taste. It might be that it's not the thing for you, or it might be something you fall in love with. But I really encourage you to try it just to see if it's a space uh, that you're excited about. But actually, one way to try it is to get involved in undergrad research to get a taste of what it's like, too. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we have a poll to try to focus on which questions the audience is most interested in. So we want to kind of prioritize what we talk about here today. So we have select the most pressing questions. How do I decide between a master's and a PhD? How is graduate school different from college? Or how long is graduate school? So these are questions that we often get um, when we do the um, track the Student Opportunity Lab at the Grace Hopper Conference, which actually is coming up next week. Next Wednesday, we have the student, the CRAW is, is a big part of those student opportunity labs and also some other sessions on, on Wednesday of next week at the, at the conference if you happen to be going, along with the rest of the 13,000 <laughs> who are going. <laughs> Lori and I will be there, so we're excited to see you if you're there. So, yeah, so we will be there, and we will at some point be at the CRAW booth. They have an actual booth there. So yeah, stop by. Stop by the CRAW booth and um, see, what, see what we're doing. So it looks like the most pressing question is how do I decide between a master's and a Ph.D.? And then the next one is how is graduate school different from college? Perfect. Um, so a master's degree is great preparation for a career as a professional. It's typically like two-ish, 18 months to two years. Um, it's a great way uh, to, to show academic potential, maybe apply later to a PhD, try things out. A PhD degree uh, is preparation for a career in computer science research. You have to have it if you want to be a professor, actually, if you want to have a job like mine. Um, and the way they compare, so the masters will be focused typically more on coursework and projects. Some masters have theses, some don't. PhD uh, degree uh, has some courses, but mostly research and dissertation focused. Um, one of the things I want to just point out, in case you don't know, is typically when you apply for a PhD program, you are funded, right? You actually get paid a little bit. It's not a huge amount of money, but it got me through um, to go to graduate school and you're funded because of the research you're doing. Um, if you, master's degrees typically are not like that um, because they are more shorter and more focused. So one thing you might think about is because uh, people, it is common for people to start a PhD and then leave with a master's. So if you're on the fence, I would say look for, uh, consider that option. About half my incoming PhD class realized that the PhD really wasn't for them, and they had a nice master's, but they didn't have to pay for it. So just a hot tip. Again, we have some deeper information on master's and PhD. Um, there's no wrong answer here. It's really what, what is most, uh, what you want and what matches your career goals the most. Yeah, I think some of it is, is getting a taste of research to try to figure out if you want the PhD or the master's. That's part of it. You that get, really helps. Yeah, if you get really excited about research, then you probably want to head towards a PhD. You actually can't get a job as a as a faculty member, as a tenure track faculty, without the PhD either. So there are jobs where you can't get them without the PhD. Or AJ's job <laughs> as an industry researcher too. Uh, but there's lots of jobs that you don't need a PhD to for. So, you know, really just think it over. All right. Are we ready for the next one? Sure. Next one. How is graduate school different from college? Um, 
or Lori, sorry, were you moving on? I was moving on to the next poll, but okay, we Okay, perfect. No, nope, let's go. We'll come back to that one. Well, we can talk about that while they're taking this poll. Perfect. Let's do that. It's like we practiced, except we didn't. Um, okay, so <laughs> graduate school and college. Um, you know, in many ways, it can be very similar, right? Uh, you could be living with a roommate. You'll have classes at the beginning. Um, they're all classes typically in your particular area, whereas in college, you might have a more uh, a breadth of classes. Um, but really what's different is that you're figuring out, you're, you're going deeper in all your subjects first in your coursework, and you're doing research and you're deciding, you're like, instead of just learning, you're actually creating knowledge, right? You're identifying a problem space, particularly in the PhD, and you are, uh, you're doing an algorithm or you're creating you know, a theorem, or, but you're basically moving the frontiers of science forward. Um, Lori, do you want to add anything to that? I know you see both all the time. No, I think that's uh, I think that's great. We do have another question from Wendy. Okay. Before we move on, um, she she's asking, what if you what if I want to do focus on research but don't want to be a professor in the future? Oh, oh my gosh. Let me just say, like half my very. Of the people who get PhDs, not everyone becomes a professor. In fact, it's becoming more and more common. Um, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, lots of places really respect the PhD. Um, what the PhD means is, uh, in, in some sense, is that you're able to identify a problem, like work independently and kind of really think through things. Um, but I have, you know, lots of friends who, who went. Uh, we see a lot of data scientists at Microsoft, so on Bing, machine learning, very popular uh, PhD, but they're working in applied research, essentially. So there are still a wealth of jobs open to you with a PhD. Um, sometimes people, you know, you have to kind of uh, fight against this uh, idea that you're like only an ivory tower person, but I think that has completely changed. Um, so there are many reasons, uh, if you love learning and you want to go deep in a subject, there will be jobs for you. Um, professor, I mean, being a professor is super cool, but if that's not your thing, uh, you don't have to rule out a PhD just on that. Okay. So the next poll is in, and the most pressing question is, how do I decide where to apply to graduate school? That is a great question. Um, so I had people who came in with me to graduate school who like knew exactly what they wanted to work on and they researched the top people in this area and they did this like incredibly thoughtful, you know, I'm going to do databases and so I need to go there because that's the person who works in databases. I really did not, I, as you probably saw, like I didn't know. I uh, looked at a bunch of grad schools. Um, I looked at grad schools that were highly ranked. I looked at grad schools that had a breadth. I actually was, it was super important to me that they were good in a bunch of subjects because I kind of knew that I wasn't sure exactly um, what field I went into and I thought I might change my mind. So I wanted my school to be good across. Um, I would say, and then of course, when you're accepted, you get to go and visit and everyone hosts a visit day. And so that is actually important too. So in many ways, it's a little bit like applying to colleges, except when you get in, you'll get very strongly wooed. Like they'll fly you out and usually, you know, you get to meet people and that will help in the decision too. So I would say, um, look broadly, if you know your area, that, that will help you narrow. Look for schools that have some depth, a uh, breadth, so that if you change your mind, you're not stuck because, you know, you took the one person in that one subject and then you changed your mind. Um, you know, your professors and your friends and people who've been in grad school are a terrific resource to, to help you understand the culture at a particular school and what, what's important at the different schools because they do vary. Yeah, so I, I do think you have to be careful not to narrow yourself down too much. Yes. So you do have to look at, um, you know, all, what are all your factors? I've had students that make an entire spreadsheet of all the factors that they think are important of, of going to school and then all the schools and they have this amazing spreadsheet of trying to figure out where are the places I should apply. And to be honest, I, I really wanted to be on the West Coast too because I was a West Coast girl and I had been on the East Coast. So like geography matters too, right? You may have all sorts of other constraints. Right, yeah, you have to look at your personal life and your wants, too. Exactly. So I have another question uh, related to that. 
would you recommend an undergraduate student to pursue HCI in grad school if they haven't taken an HCI course before? If they want to go into HCI uh, in, in right, grad, right. graduate school. Um, so what I see a lot of people doing is kind of interdisciplinary work. I think when you when you apply, you, you'll probably need to, to leverage the fact that you ha you know, you're really good at a particular subject or something like that. It might be hard to say, hey, I'm going to do HCI, but I don't know it yet, even though if you know that's what you're going to do and sort of that's what I did too. Um, but what I do see is people like threading them together, right? Like I do databases or whatever, and I'm going to bring in some HCI stuff. But to be clear, different grad schools operate differently. There are some where you take a breadth of classes in your first couple of years, and it's relatively easy for you to move advisors, right? The funding is given to you by the school. Um, and then there are other places where the funding comes from a particular person, and it's harder to move. Um, and so if you're in a situation where you think, oh, that's a really interesting area. I, d I haven't been able to explore it as deeply as I'd like. Um, I would look for schools that are more flexible, right? So you can do that exploration. There are other things you can do too, right? Uh, you can read up, you can do all sorts of things. You can find a professor at your current school who might be working in a related area and might be able to help you do like an independent study or something um, so that you can kind of do a little bit more and see if that's really the area for you. It's a great, I, I mean, obviously I love it as a research area, it's terrific. Um, the other thing you can do, um, it's interdisciplinary as well. So you can take a bunch of psychology. That's a great back, background for HCI um, because we, a lot of the methods are from psychology uh, and social science. So even if you might not have HCI at your school, you have many of the building blocks uh, for an HCI career. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me put a plug out there asking if, uh, people to submit their last questions while we continue here. We would love to have some more questions. Um, and while you're doing that, we'll move on to uh, the second most pressing question, which was, what materials do I need to apply for graduate school? Okay. I'm going to wave again. You can't read it, but the how do I successfully apply to graduate school handout, which I think is fabulous, um, which talks about how to decide where to apply, but then preparing um, application materials. Now, this is one of those things, Lori mentioned the spreadsheet, and probably you're going to need the spreadsheet because every program will be a little different, but they're going to want an application, your transcript, your letters of recommendation. Typically, there's a statement of purpose. Why do you want to go to grad school? What do you want to do? Um, test scores, so you get to take the GRE uh, and those uh, other scores, the interna or test the international ones as well. Um, so it's not it's not hard. It's just one of those things where you gotta put the time aside, tick the boxes. Um, I still remember fondly uh, studying up on those uh, vocab words for the GRE. Right, it like takes you back to high school. Um, so not not hard. Uh, one thing you might do if you, if it's a little ways off is think about who your letter writers might be. Like if it's gonna be a professor. Um, from a class, make sure they, they do know you, right? Because when you get to that point that you need letter writers, you want people who know you well and they can write a really strong letter because the letters really matter. And if you don't know someone right now, like there's still time, right? You can go and volunteer to be on a project with them. You can do a really bang up job on your next student project. Um, lots of ways, but you want to have very strong letters. Great. Okay. Uh, let's so we have an, a question from Courtney. Where do you see HCI in the next two years? Oh, interesting. Oh, great question, Courtney. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm in um, HCI is a very broad field, right? Uh, so I can probably do that better with IoT and, and UbiConf. Uh, but what's been really exciting, I think, in HCI is the emergence of all sorts of different input modalities as act. You know, people have been playing with speech for a long time, but now we see Siri and Cortana and Google Now and this whole personal assistant thing that kind of puts together user experience and um, intelligence or learning. So that, I think, will be quite fascinating. It scares me a little, to be perfectly honest, but, um, but I think we have a long way, ways to go there um, in that whole assistant space. Um, and uh, for me, I find the fact that now, you know, speech – you act interaction is and gesture and all of these things is becoming um, even more common. 
Um, the second thing I would say is uh, I ran the Ubiquitous Computing Conference last year, and we had remote attendees come in on the Beam robots, which is like a talking head that you can drive around. And so I'm really fascinated to see what happens as we keep blurring the boundaries between sort of space and time, and we do these like remote web seminars, and we experiment with ways um, that people can work together, they can communicate, and they can interact, but they don't have to be physically co-located. So I think that's, that space is also changing quite fast. And of course, I think we don't even understand, um, you've probably heard of the quantified self movement where people are recording all this data and using it to really tailor and learn about themselves. Maybe, you know, it, I shouldn't eat almonds or whatever, I get a headache after this. Um, I don't know how that's going to turn out, but I think it's really interesting as we learn more about ourselves um, and our reactions to things. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. So I think that's our last question that we can take today. And we're going to move on to our feedback poll that we would like you to answer. Did this mentoring session help answer your questions about grad school? Yes, no, or I still have questions. And if you still have questions, then tweet us at CRA Women using the hashtag UGRADTH. And you can dump them right now in the questions section and we'll be following up. So um, we really want to make these um, as, as good as we can and answer as many questions. So definitely we'd love to know what's still on your mind. Right. And we would also like to, um, well, first of all, we'd like, we hope that you enjoyed the first virtual town hall. Uh, this is one of uh, hopefully many. And we appreciate that you took your time today to join us. Um, we might have a little rough edges here and there getting started on this for the first one. Our next one will be in November, and we'll be getting some advertising out for that real soon. So keep in touch at the CRAW.org. CRA, CRA well, there's lots of different ways to keep in touch with us, and you can see them here on this slide. Your feedback is really invaluable. So we do have a follow-up. A survey is going to pop up after you close out of this webinar, and we would really like to have you to answer that survey so that we can continue to improve these and see how they're, how they're working. Um, and last but not least, if you're planning on attending Grace Hopper then at, next week, then stop by our booth. It's um, number... S14 and just stop by and say hi. I think they, I think CRAW has bought some kind of toys they're giving out, and and AJ and I will both be there. So we really thank you all from CRAW and hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks.